Thank you. Um, the main source of, of what I am going to be talking about is this book. I was carrying this book for six months everywhere, you know, getting ready for the talk, and now I cannot find it. But, you but it, showed it to me. I've seen it. Yeah, it's there so, somewhere. Um, and here's the motivation. Uh, if two figures have the same area, for instance, this one, yeah, two by two and a half, the area of this would be five square units. And so is the area of this guy, one by five. Can we cut this long rectangle into pieces to make this one up? To, can we cut it into pieces, reassemble the pieces together to form this one? And the answer is, of course. All you have to do is split in half, and then you get the bottom, take the other, bo the other half and put it on top, and, th and then that's it. That's the way we, you can cover one figure with the other figure. So that's easy. Um, so, so it seems like, what is, what is the big deal? Um, the big deal happens if the figures are not so, don't have as much in common. For instance, this is a square with the same area. What is the length of one side of this square? If it has the same area as the other two figures? Yeah, yeah square root of five. So by the time you cut this into a square root of five length piece, place it in here, that's good. Then you do it again because this is about two, two and change. So you can put two of those, two horizontal rectangles of height one in here. And then you have a piece left over. And then you try to, to work with that piece, cut it into pieces to, to keep filling in. And then you keep doing that. I tried that, and I, after about 15 pieces, I gave up. Because you know, the, the, the holes keep getting smaller, and then you got to cut into pieces which don't fit quite right. So, so I couldn't do it in that way. So the question is not obvious. If, if the numbers are 2 and a half and 5, then things work out really well. But if the numbers are irrational, for instance, then things are not as, as simple. We can still do it, by the way, but it's not as simple. So the question is not, first of all, not obvious. And another interesting thing is that um, in the books of Pythagoras, the elements, um, I didn't see any reference uh, about how to cut one piece to make another one. It, there was no reference to it. That I, not, well, I couldn't find one, I should say. Um, so I don't know why they were avoiding that question, or maybe they didn't care either, either way. I couldn't find one. They still use something similar, but it's not quite the same. Uh, there are some definitions, but we can skip those. Um, so let's talk about half of the theorem. Um, we're going to say that two figures are equi equidecomposable. That's a, a mouthful. If, if one of them can be um, cut into a finite number of pieces to make the other figure. By the way, if the areas are the same, you can always cut into pieces and make up the other figure if we, if we are allowed an infinite number of pieces. So the, the catch here is that it, it has to be done in a finite number of pieces. Um, and two figures are equivalent if they have the same area. So in this case, those two f these three figures are equivalent. This is equivalent to that, and that is equivalent to that. Because they have the same area, the area is 5. And it's been known for a long time, over 2,000 years. Oh, I forgot to put Euclid. That's all right. Um, one side of this, of this theorem. Um, if figures are equidecomposable, then they are equivalent. That's that's pretty straightforward. Let me show you how we do this. Um, let's say you have five pieces to start with. Um, let's make a copy of the big one, one on the left and one on the right. And let's start adding those triangles to, to the figures on the left and on the right. But we're going to add the, fig the triangles differently. So the first time I add a triangle on the left, I'm going to put it on this end. 
the very same triangle is going to be placed to fill in this little um, gap. It's the same triangle, so we are adding the same area. I'm going to do that three more times. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm putting a triangle at the end. I'm putting a triangle here in a different place. Three, four. So do they have the same area, the, the figure on the left and the figure on the right? And the answer is, of course, because we started with the same pieces and we added equal parts. And consequently, the whole is equal. That's what was known back by Euclid uh, a while ago. So they have the same area. Uh, you can take that away, and then you can, you can see that the square has the same area as that a cross. Um, so let's talk about areas for a moment. The area of a rectangle, everybody knows how to find it. Uh, we do base times height because the area counts the number of squares of one by one that can fit into a figure. And instead of counting one by one, one, two, three, four, and so forth, we can just multiply uh, six rows by four columns, no, the other way around, six columns by four rows, so we end up with 24. So the area of this is 24. Uh, let's think about the area of a parallelogram. So we're taking a little tangent, and we're going to talk about areas for a moment to see how this cutting and, and, and pasting works or can help us find areas. Uh, let's say you have the area of, uh, rather, a parallelogram. We can cut the parallelogram straight up from, from this base, 90 degree angle, make a cut. And then we can move this triangle and place it back here to make a rectangle. That explains how we find, well, that's one way of explaining how we, we find the area of a parallelogram, base times height. Again, why? Because the base of this rectangle is the same base as the parallelogram, and the height is the same. All we did is cut, move the piece, and we have a rectangle. Somebody could ask, well, what if the the parallelogram is too skinny or, or too far to the right. We can still do that. If we start with this, start making cuts, uh, here are the cuts. By the way, the way we, we build the cuts is you go across the same distance as the base and cut up. Same distance as the base and then cut, make a cut. Same distance, make a cut. And then we can... Uh, move those parallelograms. By the way, what we obtain are little parallelograms. Those parallelograms can be moved to make the rectangle. So even if, if, if the parallelogram is tilted too far on one side, we can still cut and put together a rectangle. What about a triangle? Again, I'm talking about areas for a moment to see how we can apply this concept of cutting and pasting to figure out areas of figures. So this is a little bit of a tangent. Um, the way we can visualize this is to cut across the middle, exactly the middle. And by the middle, we mean take the height, go half distance, and make a cut, a horizontal cut, which is parallel to the base, tilt the top, and form a parallelogram. Uh, the, the angles are going to work perfect, because the, this is a 180 degree angle. So when we rotate it, we still have 180 degrees. Something to notice is that we are, by doing this, we are not adding anything to the base. The base is still the same base as the base of the triangle. And we know the area of a, of a parallelogram because we just saw how to obtain it base times height. The base is the same base as the triangle. The height is half of the original triangle. And that's how we obtain the area of a triangle, base times half of the height. By reassociation and commutativity, we can rearrange the numbers. So the area of a triangle is half of the base times height. So this is a neat way to, to visualize where that comes from. Um, again, if the, 
if we have a triangle that is tilted too far in one direction, you can still do the same. Cut across the middle, tilt, and we obtain a parallelogram. Yeah. So it, this works for any triangle. You can, you can form a parallelogram quite easily by simply cutting across the middle. What about a trapezoid? Same thing. Cut across the middle, tilt, and paste the pieces together. And we have the area of, well, we have a parallelogram for which we can find the area easily. Notice that the base has increased this time. That didn't happen with a triangle. So the base of this parallelogram is the base of the original parallelogram. I'm sorry, I keep saying parallelogram. The base of the trapezoid plus the upper base of the trapezoid because this, is, this base got rotated and moved down here. And again, the angles work just, just fine. There's, there's no change in the angles. This is an actual parallelogram. So what is the area of this parallelogram? Base times height. But this base is the sum of the two bases of the trapezoid. And the height is half of the original trapezoid. Hence the formula, half base 1 plus base 2 as a quantity multiplied by the height of the trapezoid. So that's how we obtain the area of a trapezoid. OK. Um, so this is half of the theorem. This, is, this was a demonstration of how we can use the half of the theorem. If two figures are made up by the same pieces, then the figures have the same area. But what about the reverse? If two figures have the same area, can we cut them up into a finite number of pieces so, so they can be a reassemble one into another? And that's what we're going to prove next. Uh, Here's the question. We need five lemmas before we can finish proving this. The first lemma is that uh, if figures are equidecomposable, if, if two figures are equidecomposable, and then the second figure is equidecomposable to the, a third figure, then the first one is equidecomposable to the third figure. Yep. Um, so for instance, we know how to cut this to make that, and vice versa. If we find a way to cut this into that, then we can certainly go from here to there. But how? I mean, that, that's not necessarily obvious. How can we do that? And that's what I'm going to try to show you next. Let's say we have three figures that happen to be um, equidecomposable in the sense that the C is equidecomposable to the cross, and the cross is equidecomposable with the square. This is a square. Let's see. Let me show you how we make the cuts to go from the C to the cross. That's pretty straightforward, because the C is made up by five squares. Rearrange the squares. And then we can go from the square to the cross, again, by cutting uh, into five pieces, the center and four little triangles. We can rearrange the triangles into the cross. So instead of uh, filling in this, this uh, sort of armpits, we can, we can put those triangles at the end of, of this figure, and we get the cross. So how do we get from here to there? or the other way around, uh, we overlap the two, the two kinds of cuts. So the cuts that are necessary to go from the square to the cross are preserved. And in addition to that, we add the cuts that are needed to go from the C to the cross. And those are the cuts that are needed um, to go from the C to the square. So the C is made up now by nine pieces, one in the center, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The C is, is made up by nine pieces. And so is the square, nine pieces, which is the overlap 
of the two kinds of cuts. Uh, yeah, so actually all of the other stuff can go away. And now we can just see how, how this is done. Split the square into nine pieces. Which nine pieces? The ones that are needed for the C into the cross and from the cross into the square. We assemble the pieces to make the C and that's, that's how we can show that if we have three figures, let me go back. Uh, yeah, three figures that are equidecomposable, the C into the cross, the cross into the square, then we can go from the C to the square by overlapping the, the, the cuts. Uh, whoops, there we go. Yep, yep, yep. So again, if I wanna go from here to there, we cut in half, whatever is needed to be cut here to go from here to there, we overlap that half and then we can form the square. By the way, to go from here to there, we need only four pieces. That's all we need. It's interesting how that's, that's done. Uh, lemma two. So lemma one was the transferability. Yeah, the, uh, lemma two is any triangle is equidecomposable to some rectangle. You can always go from triangle to rectangle. And you may be thinking, oh yeah, do the parallelogram and then change the parallelogram into a parallelogram into a rectangle, as I had shown you earlier. Actually, we're gonna do this differently because the parallelogram has a complication. If, it, if the parallelogram is tilted too much, then have, we have to justify how the pieces fit together. So this is the way we do it. Take the triangle and place it so the longest side of the triangle, if there's a longest one, is the base. Then draw the, the height of the triangle, which is always gonna be inside the triangle. It's never gonna be outside. If you always use the longest side as the base, this height is always gonna cut into the triangle. And then this is gonna be half the height. Open up the two triangles on top and form a rectangle. So we can always, always take a triangle and turn it into a rectangle, always. Because triangles have a longer side. And if, if we have a, a triangle with three sides that are equal, then just pick any one and that will do. Okay, so that's lemma two. This is a very, very interesting lemma. Um, we have two parallelograms so this is with a common base. This is the base, and then this parallelogram, and this other parallelogram, which have exactly the same height. If you have two parallelograms with common base and the same height, then you can always uh, split one to form the other. And the splitting is, is very, very neat. Um, split the one on the left, by drawing parallel lines to this, to those lines. Yeah, they're not over, they're not exactly the same, so one has to be tilted one way versus the other. Even if both are to the left, the angles at which they are tilted is different. So cut this way, and the distances at which you cut are the same as the distance of, of this triangle. Yeah. Well, here we run out of room, so we have to cut yeah, using this distance, which is the same. These are parallel, parallelograms. Do the same thing on the other side using the other um, diagonals. Those two are perfectly congruent, and so are those two. Those two. Those two, and the little triangles are congruent. You can actually move them across to and they'll match perfectly. And there is no trick here. I, I, it took forever, there, because you could start shrinking it or stretching, and there's no trick, none whatsoever. It took for, it was hours and hours trying to do these drawings. Uh, so yeah, this rectangle is exactly, I can tell you these slopes, this is a slope of one, slope of negative two, it, everything works. Uh, yeah, there, there's no trick. So you can, 
take this and place it here. Take this one, and it's going to fit here. Move this one, and it's going to match exactly the same shape as that. And of course, the triangle too moves. Uh, one more there. <laughs> so you can always change, or I always cut one parallelogram into the other parallelogram as long as they have a shared base and the same height. Before we continue, oh, this is just another drawing. Uh, I want to note something about, about this last lemma. Don't confuse this lemma with lemma number or proposition number 35 in book one of Euclid. He says something similar, but not quite the same. Um, he says that if two parallelograms have the same base and equal height, then they have the same area. I'm not saying, and the lemma we just proved doesn't say that. It's, it says that if two parallelograms have a common base and same area, no, 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 same height rather, which is the same thing as the same area, um, then we can split one into pieces and reassemble the pieces to make the other one. It, it, yeah, it is not exactly the same. In fact, I'm going to show you what, what, how, how uh, Euclid proved this in, in the book or how this was proven in, in the book. Uh, so same picture, studying picture. Uh, we draw the line across. It's not too hard to prove that we have this triangle that, I, that I'm showing you. And this triangle, this other triangle, are congruent. It's very easy, actually, to prove that because we have parallelograms. So whoops. Yeah, there. So those two triangles are congruent. The angles work out perfect. There's too many reasons why those triangles are congruent. And let me see. There we go. Um, so those two triangles are congruent. Let's look at both of them together, just those two triangles that I was showing you. They are congruent. You can, there's an overlap. And if there's an overlap, you can take away the overlap, and then those two figures are, well, no, are equivalent. They have the same area. By the way, this triangle is not in the picture. So this trapezoid is, has the same area as this trapezoid, which is what proposition number 35 in the book one of Euclid we are trying to prove. But then we add this. And we're using uh, common notions of Euclid. If you add equals to, e to, to equals, then the holes are equal. So if this is equal to that, you can add this triangle. And then this parallelogram is equal to this parallelogram. By the way, Euclid calls equal figures with the same area. That's what, what he calls equal. And yeah. Yeah. So did he use cuts? Not necessarily, sort of, but not, not really. We, and we're proving something else anyway. Lemma four. Let's move on to the next lemma. Again, that Euclid was a tangent, a little tangent to this. Um, lemma four. Two rectangles of equal area are equidecomposable. That means that we can cut one into pieces to form the other. And uh, we might be tempted to do this. Slide one across in top of the other, cut to separate this, move that, uh, move that down here, there, cut again, uh, split this into so that it, it fits here nicely. And then you can keep doing that, but again, we don't know if how long this is going to take. Is it going to take uh, you know, four or five cuts, or is it going to take 10 or 20 or 100 or forever? I, I, I did not prove this, but I, I don't know if, if it will take forever to do this one, to this and to that. 
I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So, so this process doesn't work too well. Let's try again. Uh, move one rectangle with the longest side closer to the other one. Tilt it in such a way that this corner lines up with the top of this triangle. In fact, you can see the line now. Yeah. So this corner lines up with the top of the triangle. Make a cut. Move that piece. And it fits. It is going to fit perfectly into here. That's kind of neat how I'll do it again. Yeah. Tilt until this corner reaches the same height as that. Uh, cut across. Separate this piece, which will be a triangle, and move down. That is enough for the, for, to prove the lemma. Because in the previous lemma, we showed that if you have two parallelograms, this parallelogram, with the same area, and they have the same area because we started with rectangles of the same area, and this other parallelogram, then we can decompose one parallelogram into the other one. That's what we showed in lemma number three. So this is enough. We don't have to go any farther. I went farther because I couldn't help it. I separated that one, and then I moved the triangle, and yeah, it works. The reason why we don't want to show this last part as part of the, of the proof is because what if the parallelogram is tilted too far to one side, then, then we have to make more cuts. This works nicely with this one, but in fact, if you attempt to do that with this one, which will work, uh, you move this rectangle until they kiss each other, the, this square and the rectangle, then you tilt until this corner lines up with that, and then you just start cutting this distance down but the thing is that it, it, this is going to require, I did it on my notebook, it takes two cuts instead of just one. So it will require four pieces instead of three pieces. But it, it is possible to do that. So now we know how to change this into that. How many pieces was that? Four. Yeah, four pieces. And then to go from here to here, only two, but it's not six, because we didn't add them together. Because when we had that C and the cross and the square, we had five and five, and we didn't come up with 10, because. So we, it's, mo it's less than six, less than or equal to six. The number of, of pieces to, to go from here to there is less than or equal to six. Could be up to six. Yeah. I think it is five. but. Um, um, lemma five, any polygon is equidecomposable to some rectangle. So if you have a random polygon, how many sides does that have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sides. You can cut it into triangles. And then the triangles, each one of the triangles can be made into a rectangle. So first split it up into triangles, split up the polygon into triangles, one, two, three, four, five uh, triangles. Each triangle can be made into a rectangle. We show that in lemma number two, remember? And then the second triangle can be made into a triangle. And you may say, well, but what if the two, I meant the second triangle can be made into a rectangle. But what if the second rectangle has a different base? No problem. That's what lemma four is four, so that we can change one rectangle into another rectangle. So we can do this with the help of lemma two and lemma four. We're using two lemmas to do this. And we can stack up the pieces. So we can always change, again, by cutting. Now, how many times do we have to cut a lot. Uh, we need to cut, to, we, need to, we need to make two cuts. Well, it depends how, how you count the cuts, but across and down. 
to make a rectangle, let's say this one, then two more, but then we have to adjust it to make this, the rectangle fit into this one. So we may need about five. So again, it depends how you count the cuts. If this is two cuts or this is, it depends how you count, but maybe uh, two, how many did I say here? Five, let's just say five. So we need about 20 something cuts to make this rectangle. But we can always do it, and it is a finite number of cuts. So here are the five lemmas. Um, Equidecomposability is transitive, so we, we can transit, transit from one to the third. Going from one to two is the same thing, and, and two to three is the same thing as going from one to three. Um, triangles can be made into rectangles. Um, the one about the parallelograms. A, oh, the one about the two rectangles that we can cut in from one into the other. And then finally, the one about polygons. So now we're ready for our theorem. The theorem, the name of the theorem is wallace bolia gerwin which was uh, apparently done in the 1800s. I think they came up with the answer independently. Uh, those are the years when they came up with the answers. I, I think those two published it first, and then this one said I did it first, and I don't know how that goes. But it, it, the con there seems to be consensus that it was in the early 1800s. Yeah. So we went from the Greeks not doing this until the 1800s when somebody thought, hey, can we cut one figure to make other figures if the figures have the same area? And even if somebody says yes or no, we have to say why or how, and we're show showing how right now. Um, so how does it work? If you have two polygons, we're gonna assume those two polygons have the same area, and I believe they do have the same area. This is the one that took me about half an hour to draw. Um, this rectangle has the same area, so we can make this polygon into this rectangle. Let's see, by drawing the, cutting the, the triangles and making the triangles into rectangles. Cutting this into triangles, which are many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's a tiny little one Six, oh, I lost track. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Uh, and then we cut into eleven pieces. I have to admit to you, I don't know if those individual pieces correspond, those vertical strips correspond to the triangles. That's the one part I, I was not going to be precise because it was going to be way too much. <laughs> So, so that's the only part that is not precise. So that's how we do it. But, but this shows how we go about getting from this polygon to this polygon. Um, yeah. But you're not gonna be happy without actually seeing it done. I hope you're not happy. And there is a place where you can go and see it done. This is the website. Okay. Yeah. And actually, I, I had those kind of pieces pre drawn. Uh, replay. Okay. So here we have about the same kind of picture I had before and that. And uh, I think the program will do it on its own. I just got to click. Yep. So. This program takes each one of the triangles, makes rectangles of the same width to form a big rectangle, then splits the, the big rectangle into vertical rectangles, which then form triangles <laughs> that form the other figure. 
Isn't that the neatest thing ever? Because <laughs> I wasn't going to put 80 pieces or whatever how many pieces together. That, that is the coolest thing. I don't know. This was done in California. I looked at the college, and it's a, it's a small college in California. I think it's a private small college. Um, and you can play with this. You can, you can draw whatever you want. Let's say, oh, let's say you want to draw something um, like this. And then you want to make it into a sort of a rectangle. Uh, that shouldn't take too long. The first thing that you should notice is that are the areas the same? Because the areas have to be the same for this to work. So the program takes care of that. Once I click in the circle again, the first thing the program does is scales them, scales the, the, the shapes. Oh, it only took two, yep, two and two. See, that was much simpler. And yeah, and you can do anything uh, with, with this. Um, yeah, you can play. You cannot cross, though. If I attempted to, to do this, it doesn't happen. So you have to go this way, for instance. And again, let's do something simple. Uh, there, like a kite. Oh, I have to come back. There. One, two, three, four. I think it takes only two triangles to do this. One, two. So again, that is the neatest thing I, I found about this. And if you want to find it, if you put if you uh, if you put in Google or any other search engine, Caesar's congruence, you you should be able to find this this program easily. So let me go back to the presentation. So so we can do it. I showed you how to do it. If the figures are really complicated. We can still do it, but I did not show you how to do it. The program did, <laughs> how, to, how to actually cut the pieces. Um, how do I, oh, I remember. There, so go back to the presentation, back to the PowerPoint. Um, let's analyze this a little bit. Yeah, let's analyze this. Let's say this is a side of the polygon. I want to point uh, to something about, about polygons. Well, the, the inside of the, the, in, the sum of the inside angles of a polygon is always a multiple of 180. A triangle, the inside angles of a triangle is, add up to 180. The inside angles of a, of a rectangle, or actually a quadrilateral, add up to 360. How about a pentagon? 540? Yeah, and so forth. Um, and whenever you add, so let's say you have a straight edge of, of, a, of a polygon, and if you add to it you know, some kind of triangle, we're always adding uh, multiples of 180. It, it, it always happens to be 180 or 360 or 540, or 720, or 1080, and so forth. It's always multiples of 180. Uh, again, because when you add anything like this, like a triangle, you're adding this angle, actually this angle, which is 180 plus the little bit of the triangle, this angle, and this angle, which is 180 plus a little bit of a triangle. So if you modify a polygon and you add this point to it, then you're adding 180, 180, three times 180. Uh, the same thing happens if, if you cut away from a figure. 
uh, let's see, because we are taking away this angle, we're taking away this angle, which are the same as adding this angle and this angle, plus we're adding 180. So when you cut away from a shape, you end up adding 180 degrees. So you, you always add 180 whenever you modify, or take away 180, uh, any shape. Even here, oh, if you want to change this and add a corner, stretch the corner of this shape, uh, let me think. I don't think we're adding anything because we're replacing one triangle with another triangle. So we're taking away these angles, which are up to 180, but then we're adding these angles, which are up to 180. So everything works in multiples of 180. Um, same thing happens if you go the other way. It's a little more complicated. So if you start here with a convex shape and then you make it concave, are we adding 180 or subtracting 180 or multiples of 180? And the answer is yes. I have to think about why. Okay, so we're taking this, this, and this off. So that's 180 that we're taking off. Furthermore, we're taking this and those off, those measurements, but then we're adding this. Well, those two together make up this angle, so we're adding 180. So we always end up adding or subtracting 180. Whenever you change one polygon into another polygon, the 180 is there, multiples of 180. Am I, am I making sense? That we just, it's 180 is there. Yeah, uh, the sum of the inside angles of a polygon is a multiple of 180. Yeah, because we keep adding this plus this plus this plus that plus that plus that. So when you add all of those angles, they add up to five times 180, which is 900 degrees. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So the sum of the inside angles of a polygon is always a multiple of uh, 180 of a polygon, yeah. And we can never get something that is not a multiple of 180. So for instance, can we get 90 degrees as the sum of the angles of a polygon? No, no way. Or any odd number like 75 or, we cannot do that. It's always gonna be a multiple of 180. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because in 1900, Hilbert had a list of questions, math questions. And the third one was, can the result in two dimensions can be carried over to three dimensions? In other words, can I cut this shape into pieces, just with a saw, to form this shape? And actually it took very little. Dan happens to be a student of Hilbert and he answered the question, I believe, a year later. He said, no, you cannot do that. No matter how much you try, you cannot cut this into this, even though we could do that with plain figures. We're assuming they have the same volume, of course. I don't know if they have the same volume, but let's assume they do. So we cannot cut this into that with a finite number of cuts. You could with an infinite number of cuts, but not finite number of cuts. So the question is, how did Dan show it? Um, so there is the two, the two shapes, tetrahedron, regular tetrahedron, and a cube. Um, yeah, the main reason is that the, the angles don't add up. The angles don't work out. This comes with a different set of angles than this one, and they don't, they don't add up together nicely. Let me show you. Let's say you have a surface, any surface. If you make a carving, a, po uh, a carving with straight edges, and then you position that carving somewhere else, because you want to preserve the volume, so you have to move that somewhere else, you're not changing the angles. The angles are still going to be multiples of one. Actually, no, I take that back you're changing the angles by multiples of 180, and 180 only. 
And the reason, although it gets more complicated than this, is because by doing this, we're creating an angle here, well, actually three angles, the inside angle of a polygon. We're assuming the inside is here and this is the outside. We're creating angles, three angles, and those are equal to the angles that we are adding here that we did not have. Probably a better picture is this one. When you make a carving, when you cut into a solid with a straight plane, we are creating this angle. When you place that back into, a, into the solid in some other place, we are going to be adding the supplement of the angle plus 180. So we are creating this angle, which is the supplement of this one. So we're adding 360 together. Yeah, so we always, let me go back to the other picture. By doing this, we're adding 360, by, by, by carving and adding that piece into, into the surface of, of a solid, we're actually adding 360, 360, and 360, so 1,080. We're adding 1,080 degrees to the inside angle of a polyhedra. Yeah, but we're always, we're always adding 180 degree multiples. Yeah, and that's the problem. Right there, that's the problem. Then on, the only thing Dan did is showed one counterexample. This counterexample is the one he showed. Um, it turns out that the inside angles of this polyhedra is about seven, no, it's about 282 degrees. Yeah. And the inside um, angles of this cube, well, it's 90 times, how many times do we have 90? 12, isn't it? Because it's one, so the white with the green, so that's one, two, three, four. Same thing on the other side, so that's another four. Plus then the sides are another four, so that's 12 times 90. That's six times 180. How much is that? 1,080. Oh, 1,080, yeah. And if you add multiples of 180 to 282.12, we're never going to get to 1,080. So that is the proof. We can, the angles don't work. It doesn't matter how much you cut, you know, because every time you cut and you place that piece somewhere else, you're adding or subtracting 180, or multiples of 180, or 360, or 540. So this is not going to work. Now, I'm giving you a short version of the proof. The proof is longer than that. This is, this is a very, very super short version of the proof. It's, yeah, it's, it, it, in that book that I was reading, I don't know, maybe five, six pages. It, it took a while, because. Sorry, sorry, could we prove this? We, we would take a piece of butter. We, we cut it exactly at the, at the right angle. We melt it. Ah, uh, ha. Uh, by melting it, we, we are doing the equivalent of splitting it up into an infinite number of pieces. Yes, yes, that's a good, a good way to, to, to show that, it, that we could do it with an infinite number of pieces. Well, hang on, if, if we melt it, it's not an infinite number of pieces. You are correct. It's still, it's still a, so is it just sort of sufficiently large then? No, no, what happens is that we, our, uh, our measurements are not good enough. Yeah, yeah. Even at the atomic level, piece you can still cut into smaller pieces. And, and the question yeah. would be whether the polygon, or you know, to be a polyhedron that you're cutting out, and if you're melting. Yeah, right. and yeah, and we're not cutting it. But oh, well, you could argue you you are because you're taking little atoms or molecules. Are they necessary? Yeah, I, I know it's yeah yeah yeah. That, that's a good question. <laughs> So if we could cut with a knife, the answer is no. And in the freezer so they don't melt. <laughs> uh, 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 
then you would have a problem in the freezer because you would have either retraction or expansion. You, that's a good point. That's a good point. So under ideal conditions, it won't work. <laughs> Because the angles don't add up. But you're right. If we melt it, it definitely works. That's it. That's all I have for, for you guys today. Yeah, some, about 10 minutes early. Any, any questions about anything? This. I got a lot of questions. I'll fold it. I'm thinking about butter melting. <laughs> <laughs> so under what conditions will two solids be? Um, so the, the, the cube and the tetrahedron are not. I are not. Notice that. Yep. But, but under certain conditions, certainly, they, you can get two solids that will be a rectangular box and a cube. Would be, it would be composable because there's no problem with angles because the angles are all the same. Two prisms are. Yeah. So then, I guess, as a general question, under what conditions would two Polygonal solids be equally composable. I'm going to speculate if the angles correspond to the same class by adding or subtracting 180s. When you say same class, meaning? So if this polygon, this tetrahedron has, no, polyhedron, so if a polyhedron inside angles is any random number, say 500, 500 even, and this one is 180 more. See, I'm spec so let me back up. The actual answer is I don't know. <laughs> I'm, sp I'm speculating that if they add or subtract to 180, then, they, then things will work out, but that's a speculation only. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is, the, is the fact that for the tetrahedron you've got a, the arc cosine of one third, which is of course irrational, is that of any significance? No, it, it is just a computation. Uh, is uh, the irrationality of any significance to the fact that you've got. Uh, that's a good, uh, where is it? Is it here? Or, yeah. Um, um, they work this out with cosines because in the actual proof that it was about six pages or so, the way they proved it was with cosines. So I just used that. And it is, it turns out that it's not too hard to figure out the cosine because they had to figure out what is the angle actually. And they're not going to say, uh, 70.53, they want to be more precise. And one way to be precise is to actually give it a cosine. That way we know there's one angle. It's like with the dot product, don't Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what they did. So yeah, they did a little bit of Calc 3. Very little, but they did some of that, yeah, to figure out the cosine. Yeah, and it's not, it's not too hard, actually. Um, the center. Do you guys know how far it is from the base? It is one third. Always the center of a triangle is one third from the base. And then you do this. No, it is, it is more complicated. I, I cannot show you. Yeah. But you, it takes about 10, 15 minutes to figure that out, that the cosine of the angle is one. What did I say, one fourth? Yeah, one fourth. I can try to attempt to do it, but yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Did the book, was, was this book only on polygons, or did it talk about non-polygon shapes? Only polygons. The tangents that the book took was, because people go, went crazy, apparently, doing this. The Russians did go crazy. Because then they added more conditions on how can we cut it and they, one condition they added was, can we make the cuts, all the cuts are parallel? Instead of cutting one way and then the other, can we make the cuts so they are all parallel? And uh, I think the answer is yes. 
So you can add other conditions to the problem to make the problem more interesting, even more interesting. But what was, I don't know if I answered your question. Your question was, No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you know if, if there's a, a direct relationship between the number of, of triangles that a polygon is composed of and the number of uh, points? Vertices. Vertices. If the polygon is regular, no, convex, then that's not too hard to figure. Yeah. So there's there is no concavities, then you, you can always do, there's one, one triangle, yeah, so let's count, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that is one, two, three, four. So I, I think it's two less than the number of vertices. But it gets more complicated when we have, and I on purpose put convec concavities in the picture I was showing you with that program because then things get more complicated. With, with that, yeah, yep. I have marked the cuts, so this turns into that. If you're curious, if you go two units, uh, I believe you cut here. Okay, and then I hope I remember. No, I'm not gonna remember. Never mind. But it's, it's about four cuts that it takes to do this. Only four to, to move this into that. Because here, if this is two and this is one, by Pythagoras, this is the square root of five. So right there, you get this side. So you can start putting it together that way. Yeah. So is there, uh, like for the concave polygon, there is a, a clear, it's two less triangles than the number of vertices? So is there any rule for the, the convex? No, you, you're saying the or convex, concave. Yeah, for the yeah. convex one, yeah, right. the rule applies. For the convex, I don't know. I think, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Yep. I have a quick pedagogical question. Sure. When, when you folks teach uh, math geometry, you go through things like Alejandro was beginning with areas, you start with a rectangle, you go to the parallelogram, you go to triangles. Do you show visuals like that? Mm -hmm. I and never, we do with the with the um, polyhedra too. So oh wow, you know, we we've got a cube and we've got um, the three rectangular. Uh, You know, I've known some math for a while, but I've never actually seen that done as really cool. I know it's, I know it's very straightforward, but it's like, that's really cool. Yeah. There, there's one. Some of this logic of tessellations, too. There's one more thing that I learned from, from this, studying this. Because um, I always, in cal calculus two, we always find volumes, and I always tell my students the volume of a prism no, a pyramid is the base times the height and the divided by three, which is true. And I always wanted to know why in a geometric sense. It turns out that we cannot do it geometrically. Actually, the book shows that we cannot show geometrically why we have the one third. It actually, they actually show it. So that's another tangent they go into. Um, you have to use calculus. There's no other way you have to use calculus. You can kind of guess that it is one third, but you cannot prove by using geometry that the volume is one third of the area of the base times the height, which is true. You cannot use geometry. Because you cannot show the congruences that the pieces you end up with by start cutting don't, you cannot work with them nicely. You cannot show that they have the same volume. You end up with pieces that have the same volume, but you cannot show you that with geometry. You, you have to use calculus, limits. 
which, is, which I found very, very, very interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.